Bomatum, Ahom, Mawika, Dakar, Kurewa Tainokai, Bomatum, Musika Guakia, Ahe Kasabi, Urakanwa, Maboya Wa, Ukiwama, Diosa Naboria Daka, Al Al Tatu. Kama kwayari, taneke bohio, wariko, choreto. Waiko kaona, wariko seneko kakona, wariko aku, wariko haum. Wakia baba, tura itoka, wamke ni, wamikara ya we, wariko, wakia, tainoti, omatum. Usika wakia, ahe kasabi, urakano wa, maboya wa, ukiwan, yosana boria daka, anhan, katu. Good evening, taikaraya. I am Kasike Turewata Ino Kai, uh, superior chief of the Sibuko Bayamon Taino tribe. I'm going to go into uh, a presentation entitled Our Names, Our Honor. Um, it's a presentation uh, about our history, about uh, our uh, historical holocaust um, in the Caribbean being the first people to encounter Europeans. Um, go into our subsequent enslavement and misclassification. We're going to go into this presentation um, wishing many blessings to everyone. Thank you very much for uh, liking and subscribing the video and look for future presentations in regards to um, indigenous issues, uh, Taino issues, Aboriginal American issues, um, Indian issues, or the issues of the people of, uh, of America historically misclassified, enslaved, um, detribalized, denationalized, and disenfranchised, and in the process of rebuilding forward for the future. For your children, for my children, for our Guayli, um, and in respect to our Aracuel. Okama! Aracoe, Totu, Atunaka. Our names, our identity, our honor. Today we're going to be discussing who are the Taino people, what happened to them. Columbus Day, ethno history, control and colonization, remedy and reclassification. Taino people or Taino Indians, are a subgroup of the Arawakan Indians, a group of American Indians in Northeastern South America and the Caribbean. They inhabited the Greater Antilles and still do, comprising Cuba, Jamaica, Hispaniola, or Quisqueya, Haiti and the Dominican Republic, and Puerto Rico, or Borinquen, in the Caribbean Sea at the time when Christopher Columbus arrived to the New World. We're also talking about the Lesser Antilles, inhabited by Arawak subgroups, also known as the Kalanago, Carib, or Caribe. You can see here the Greater Antilles, Borinquen, Quisaqueya, Haiti, Bojo, or called Española by the colonizers. Saimaca, Yamaye, Jamaica, Cubanacan, or Cuba, or Cobao, Lucayo, the Bahamas, or the Cays, Los Cayos, Florida, Bimini, and this is in Bagua, the Caribbean Sea. You see here the Lesser Antilles, 
the Kalinago or Carib Territory islands leading to eastern South America. The Taino were the first indigenous people to greet the Spanish in 1492. The name Taino was given by Columbus when the men greeted him saying Taino, Taino. Taino means we are good, noble. Columbus thought that Taino was the name of the people. Now there are histories that point to earlier times where the Portuguese and Spanish before 1492 in Florida or La Florida where they met indigenous people there comprised of of uh, many different groups so there is some controversy and some rewriting of history based on knowing these things but for the purposes of this conversation we're going to talk about who the Taino were and the record of meeting them in 1492 Government. Taino Indians lived in theocratic kingdoms and had a hierarchically arranged chiefs or caciques. The Taino were divided in three social classes the Namboria, or class, the Nitaino, or subchiefs and noblemen, which includes Bojique, or priests and medicine men, and the caciques, or chiefs. Each village, or Yucayeque, had one. And so when we're talking about Tainos living in theocratic kingdoms in hierarchical arrangement, we're talking about caciques or chiefs being considered kings or being considered as the divinely appointed guidance and rulership. And this is what we talk about when we, we're talking about theocratic. It's a form of government in which a deity is officially recognized as a civil ruler and official policy is governed by officials regarded as divinely guided or is pursuant to the doctrine of a particular religion or religious group. Ours being our belief and creation stories, our cosmology, our cosmogony, and how that gave us guidance in our culture, in our work and uh, class arrangement and it will, our following of divine leadership. This leads us into a description of our people and this is coming from Christopher Columbus. There are many very descriptions but let's go into what is historically understood. Their complexions were bronze colored, average stature, dark, flowing coarse hair, and large and slightly oblique dark eyes. Men generally went naked or wore a breech cloth called nagua, made out of cotton, saddle bay. Single women walked around naked and married women with an apron over their genitals made of cotton or palm fibers. Again, saddle bay. Uh, palm fibers, we're talking about uh, 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 fibers made from palm trees, bark, and, and the, the fiber from leafing and different parts of the plant, the length of which was a sign of rank. This is according to Christopher Columbus now. So when we look at the, the very descriptions of our people, um, they are talking about us being strong, dark-colored, or maybe not as dark as Africans in every description, but dark-colored people inhabiting these islands, which are closer to the equator, to the equatorial line, which means that we get more sun, which means that there would be, logically, a higher melanin production in our physical makeup. And today, you see, with many of our organizations hosting our areto, you see the many varied colors and descriptions of our people because we are a group of people united through culture language and history but we are not necessarily genetically homogenous we are a varying and after the uh, American slave trade the colonization of our lands and forced amalgamation we are very varied in our 
uh, phenotypical characteristics. But with all that, you can find some of these oblique eyes. You can find these shovel teeth. You can find this flowing long coarse hair. You can find fine hair, but you can find the typical descriptions in our present day people. Gender identity. Both sexes painted themselves on special occasions. They wore earrings, nose rings, and necklaces, which were sometimes made of gold. Dino crafts were few. Some pottery and baskets were made, and stone, marble, and wood were worked skillfully. Again, this is coming from uh, uh, Christopher Columbus. So to understand, we lived in Bojos, huts, and in, in Yucayeques, villages. We're together, men and women. Men, uh, we had our language, but we also had dialects of the language based on sex. So the women had a language, the men had a language, and our children learned first language from their mothers. So they did learn the women and, and, and children's language first, and then um, if they were male, they learned the male equivalent of our Taino. Historical mistruths. The European account of history states when the Spanish settlers first came in 1508, according to this account, since there is no reliable documentation, anthropologists estimate their numbers to have been between 20,000 and 50,000. But maltreatment, disease, flight, and unsuccessful re rebellion diminished their numbers to 4,000 by 1515. In 1544, a bishop counted only 60. But these two were soon lost. Again, now this is a historical mistruth. This is why I'm mentioning it. I'm mentioning it because they severely underestimated the numbers in order to make themselves uh, appear to have wiped out or completely uh, eliminated our social system, our theocratic system, and our belief system. Uh, when the numbers today are estimated in the hundreds of thousands and the millions across the Antilles. And it's hard for anyone to, to take this seriously when they're talking about 20,000 to 50,000 at this point. But this leads us into historical mistruths. When we go back into some of uh, the descriptions of our people, they're so varied that we find that there is misleading uh wording, misleading ideas, and placed misdirection. And this leads us to inaccuracies. We know these estimates to be overt fabrications. They're lies due to records of large numbers of Taino enslaved amongst the Africans in the 1530s, having been observed by Governor Vallejo. Due to their similar phenotypical appearance, the Spanish found it hard to distinguish between them all and created a systemic classification of Negro or Black or Colored, eventually leading to the classification of Pardo, which is essentially a, a mixed class of all the melanated people because they didn't want to distinguish between them. They didn't want to give them uh, acknowledgement of their cultural identity, their ethno history, or their lineages. They just wanted to make them stateless, um, tribeless, slave subjects to carry out work and enrich the Spanish Empire and all of the European empires. This is the genocide that was committed against us. So today you find, just like then, in America, the black people. And then we have also derivations, African-American, Afro-Caribbean, um, Afro-Latino, uh, Black, Negro, Colored. All of these are genocidal misclassifications depriving our people of our human right to our culture, our lineage, and our history. So when... We talk about this, it goes right into systemic reclassification. Our country's natives, and this is from the book again by Luida Figueroa, the Native Issue book, Colonization of Puerto Rico. 
Our country's natives seem to have been typed as Indians until the beginning of the 16th century when Governor Don Toribio Montes, faced with the difficulty of fixing ethnic origins, banded all the nine whites together under the title of free colored people, pardos, to sum up as far as the physical absence of natives in Puerto Rico is concerned. The term to be used is absorption, not extermination. The absorption was cultural, although we are not aware of that. How can they distinguish today between the intricate cultural pattern which comes from the natives and what comes from the, quote, Negro, when Negro was just a, a reclassification of all of the different tribal groups in America and mostly in America because it isn't really concerning foreign uh, African slaves because those were in what they call nation castes and were identifiable, especially in the zones of culinary art, quackery, superstition, and folk knowledge inherited by the new generations over and above modern science. This is not possible. So to understand this is we already talked about in uh, previous videos how the Spanish caste system worked in terms of Negros de Guinea, Negros of Guinea or African Negros, and Negros de te Terra, Negros of Terra, or Negros of the Earth or of from the New World. Okay, it took both of them and broke them into different categories. Negros de Terra being broken into all of the different subcasts of of of, of uh, classifications of mulatto, mestizo, uh, furthermore like salsa patras, uh, um, uh, many different other derived subclassifications. Yet, um, when we're talking about Africans of Guinea, we're talking about groups that are uh, known as as uh, mandinga, as uh, specific names have to do with their tribal origins so their history is not being wiped out ours is being wiped out and we are being given their history as a substitute for our own identity and this is what has happened in the caribbean and in latin america and in america in general rather have us indigenous american aboriginal people identify with african aboriginal people or any other people other than our indigenousness because this keeps us looking at a foreign land as our homeland or as the hope of a homeland somewhere else and it gives the right to inhabit this land over to the foreigners who know who we are but have systemically reclassified us and brainwashed us and taught us a foreign ideal, an idea of a slave trade that has us coming from another point in the earth and, and teaches us to go back there and seek identity there as opposed to in our own homeland. It disenfranchises us and gives us a desire to absorb another culture as opposed to get connected to our traditional ways and identify with our brothers and sisters indigenously of indigenousness here our neighboring tribes instead of identifying um, with a foreign culture this is what's backwards about it because it keeps us leaving and not identifying with our legacy, our lineage, honoring our ancestors and building forward traditionally, knowing our staple crops, our staple trades, our agriculture, all of the green habits which we already had, which our society now is trying to turn back to or think in that mode in order to create sustainable futures. This is what we already had. This is our legacy. And so identifying with foreign lands does not keep us in our proper place, context, and position as American indigenous people to develop our land, create sustainable futures and viability and seek remedy, redress, and repatriation appropriately on our land.
It keeps us identifying with a foreigner's land, which does not accept us. You can take all the DNA tests you want. You can go, if you want, to Africa and go visit those uh, people if it tells you that you're from Africa. But since there is no way to truly connect you to that, they will not accept you with open arms and say, here's a, here's a hut, here's some land, come and live over here. This systemic reclassification also turns us into tools for the colonizer. Some of this is what we see as happening with the founding of nations, like, for example, uh, Liberia, founded in Africa, quote, as return of, of, of people, when many of the people that have come back are not accepted by the people that are there, leading to wars. So it's like a reverse European colonization with the disenfranchised masses who have been victims of genocide through slavery, disenfranchised, and then given another false ideal, which only works out to the betterment and detriment of our people, but the betterment of the European paradigm of encroachment. So when we talk about this systemic reclassification, we have examples of this. And I will give you an example leading to my family, the Kai. So this is a census listing of that's going to demonstrate systemic reclassification. And this is a census listing of my great-grandfather, Elogio Rosario Icai. This is the Censo Decimo Cuarto de los Estados Unidos, the census of 1920 in Puerto Rico. And when we go in here, we're going to clearly demonstrate how this works. And this is something that you can understand in your own genealogical studies and searches, is understanding how the trends work of reclassifying people, giving them an external classification of race which is not given by them and that being recorded in a historical record which disenfranchises our people again when i spoke about the maps in the caribbean we're talking about um places such as the lucayos or the kai when you go into uh, cuba you find the k's the different areas of island or island inlets which are called kai and that word came from our people, our Arawak American language. And the Europeans came and finding these outcrops adopted our terminology because in reality they were adopting many of our language terms, which changed the Spanish language, changed many of these uh, uh, wordings that they originally had. So they're adopting our terms and molding them into their maritime law, their maritime maps. Evidence of this in terms of modern day, okay, here's the 1920 census, here's my grandfather listed, Ologio Cai, Rosario y Cai, Cai y Rosario. And again, this census has it listed as Cai. Some later census, as time went on, listed it as Cayes or Cayes, which caused the disruption in the way that my own family recorded their uh, name in a misunderstanding. But here clearly in 1920, we have the original C-A-Y coming from the term Kai, island, meaning island or island inlet in the Caribbean. And here is the direct connection through my ancestor to our Arawakan stock and lineage through him carrying his mother's last name of Kai and honoring her. And when we look here, here's a listing of my grandfather, my great-grandfather, his children that were alive at the time. He had 11, but there's about four or five of them here because they weren't all born yet. Listing of my great-grandmother, Isabel 
Rodriguez y Padilla de Kai of Kai. And here's a listing of, of everyone that lived in that area. There weren't any streets, so they're talking about the building numbers here to the left. 217, 218, 219, 220 being where my family resided. And this is a, a farm. So this is a uh, area of land designated for agriculture to produce fruit. Now, this is what we have to look at. We have the name, relationships, possessions, um, whether they're learned in writing or not over here, but sex, color, and race, age, marital status, and many other things. But when we look here, and this is where you can see clearly what has happened. My great-grandfather identified as an Indian. He carried the name of his mother's line, Kai. He was adamant about this, also practiced our machetero arts, or aguasabara, walked around every day, working the land, represent his culture, and was adamant about this, and taught my great, my, my uh, grandparents and my, my father's line, and all of them in their family that they were dying, or that they were descended from Indians. Yet here, where we look at Ologio Rosario Kai, Jefe, right? Here's his designation. And you come over here to the side of what is the race? This is race. We have these folks, B is listed as Blanco, white. But all of my family members are listed as Morenos. Morenos coming from uh, just being dark skin or Moorish or black, de color, of color, but not listed as Indian because they didn't want to list that. They wanted to list it as being uh, destroyed and eliminated with no claim to the land because there were none of those people left. Yet right here in your records, the American census of 1920, right after they came in, after the Spanish American War, 1898, we have records of indigenous people carrying their traditional names and being misclassified and listed as Morenos here. This is how this worked. Systemic reclassification. So, in understanding this, we have clearly before us evidence of imperial genocidal practice and I have it in my line my great grandparents identifying as indigenous and being listed as Moreno without any indigenous title or, or claim in the census so understanding who are we we Taino are a race of American Indian people and we are far from extinct. You can look up articles in many different places. This one is in Diglett at WordPress.com where I got this one from. But we're talking about mtDNA, the mother's line, mitochondrial DNA, inherited only from one's mother. It never blends or changes through time or through generations. 61% of Puerto Ricans have American Indian mtDNA. This is our birthright. This is what happened to our people. Our grandfathers warring, were enslaved, transferred to other lands, separated from their families. Our grandmothers were raped. Our grandmothers were forced to marry. Our grandmothers were human trafficked. All of these things happened to our people. And we have to understand that there, even though there was no way to eliminate us because these Europeans, these foreigners came and took our grandmothers as wives. And that is our direct line and trace to who we are. Because in our cultural reference, what mattered was the mother's line. As a matter of fact, when a mother had children, it was the responsibility of the uncle, the mother's brother, to teach them in line with the ways of the tribe because the line was maintained through the mother. The father's 
responsibility was to maintain, as always, a material and to uh, teach as the children grew up into hunting tactics, survival tactics, and also the trades that they held. But a clear reference is made to maintaining the mother's name. So when we go back into this, we go back into the historical reference, how it is flawed, how it is full of lies. And this is symbolically represented in the commemoration, commemoration of Columbus Day, October 12, 1492, or Columbus Day. Columbus being changed into Indigenous Peoples Day in many places now, but still not in all places because they venerate Christopher Columbus and his voyage to the New World. But they do not seek in all places, depending on population, to honor the Indigenous people who he, who he met. And he met us. And when we look at our descriptions of our people, they're varied. For example, in some of these paintings, you see the the Spanish coming with their tapestries and their uh, dress, meeting our people, our people being of, of copper colored or a different hue, sometimes represented in different ways. But when you look at the hair, and for example, in these paintings, you see locks, okay? You see long hair, you see dreads, you see headdresses with the blue feather, the blue feather being the feather coming from the... Uh, Blue macaw, our traditional bird. But you, you see, there's a lot of lies in all of this. So this is why people are refuting the doctrine of discovery and trying to change it over from um, uh, Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day. Because within its own record and listing, there, it, it, it disenfranchises us. So this is a seeking a, 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 a desire to honor ourselves and our grandparents, our Aracoel our culture and there's a controversy around this whenever they came up with these holidays they excluded our people or Native Americans from the planning for us the invasion of America signified the beginning of the American Holocaust and first yes the Holocaust throughout all the tribes but first taken out to our people and to our uh, enslavement and attempted erasure Our Native American reaction has had positive outcomes. And we've gone into something called the revisionist movement. Truth in history and inclusion of facts other than the Euro-American perspective. Our ethno-history. Combining the use of data from several fields. We're talking about the history of a people through geography, archival records and reports, diary entries, oral history biography, archaeology, folklore, and ethnography. Creates an integrated picture of social and ethnic processes, not just from one textbook one way. No, we're talking about a broad view of understanding all the records. And we and we can't just go into Spanish history, uh, American history, English history, Portuguese history, Dutch history. We got to go and look at all of these because many times they're talking about the same groups, but those different, their different cultural context makes them identify them differently. So you list a, a people by one name in the Dutch accounts, by another name in the Spanish accounts, by another name in the Portuguese accounts, by another name in each culture. But we have to look at all this picture to form the true picture of who we are understanding that this is where we where our ancestors were we have to go through 500 years of this stuff this injustice in order to get a good picture when christopher columbus first set foot on the sands of guanahani island which is called guadalupe today guadalupe guadalupe he performed the ceremony to take possession of the land for the king and queen of spain this was referred to as legal claim he made a claim he put down that flagpole and said, I claim this land. But it's never been refuted. This is what we're doing today, is refuting these uh, doctrine of discovery, the, the legal claim, with our own legal claim. Because we weren't skilled and, and knowledgeable in their system. They're coming with their system. We have our own system. And they never told us what these ceremonies and rites that they were performing meant. And we were just respectful, giving them their respect, letting them be who they are. But today, 
after our disenfranchisement and American Holocaust, we're coming back and we're refuting, we're taking possession, and we're walking in our title as the nobles of this land. Again, we're coming from theocratic kingdoms, kingdoms, casi cascos, okay? So the history has been warped and we're here to correct it. So this is all based on religious doctrine. Pope Nicholas V, to declare war on all non-Christians, enemies of the Catholic Church and less than human. They considered us less than human. So they didn't find any problem with enslaving us, slaughtering us, or doing anything to us because in their idea, unless we claim Christianity, this is a forced foreign ideological system of religion and control that they used first thing they did when they went to conquer a, a new land or to invade a new land is try to make everyone Christians. And if they weren't, then it was justified to kill them. Man, human, boy, woman, child, girl, didn't matter, elder or minor. This is what they did. So this is why I find it so hard to accept that foreign ideology and continued programming because I know better. There's never been an option or attempt at counterclaim or any remedy for the colonizers and their descendants until now, until what we're doing um, in our walk, the Federation of Aboriginal Nations of America, what we're doing in our tribes, the Sibuco Bayamon Taino, the Sebuku Mahawa Casigasco. What we're doing is counterclaiming. They're making a resistance which we never had the understanding to make until now. Pope Alexander VI Intercatera Document 1493 listed our people as discovered people who were to be subjugated and brought into the faith. Missionaries were assigned with this. Soldiers also. Christian powered viewed indigenous people as lawful spoils or prey of their civilized conquerors as victims and only right as prey. That's how they treated us. The doctrine of discovery being refuted was a British grant to Cabot to take possession of the lands in spite of occupants currently residing there. So it's basically we just gonna go move in and, and seize control of your property because we see many values and assets on your land and we're also gonna wipe your memory of who you thought you were and make you into what we think or kill all of you control this is a religious system of control first it's religious through uh catholicism and, and and christianity and then subsequently it's socially through a system of commercialism of uh commerce corporate commerce which is not just the same as, as let's say a uh, 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 free enterprise amongst indigenous groups and tribal groups, but this is a new evolved form of whitewashing and control. So the religious system and idioms of genocide, Christianity and Spanish, Spanish language were forced on our dino people through coercion and duress. Europeans forcefully bred an entire slave caste with many der derivations by raping our Taino women and forcing the children into labor through encomienda. Eventually, a policy of blanqueamiento was instituted by the Spanish in Puerto Rico or Borinquen, specifically among other islands, but specifically there, to lighten up the complexion of the population of Borinquen. In this time, when they instituted blanqueamiento, they subsidized this by giving all the European foreigners opportunities to resettle on our islands. This is why you have large populations of uh, uh, Portuguese, for example, around Ponce. And you, many different uh, uh, Islandeses or, or different kinds of Dutch and, 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 and uh, 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 all kinds of Europeans uh, with historical presence on our land after colonization because they wanted them to come and whatever could lighten up our complexion and make us not who we are is what they subsidized because they want to keep us in the bottom. 
let us remember less and less who we were. We get farther and farther from making our claim, our counterclaim, and our title. Names and identity. Dainos and their mestizo or mulatto descendants, depending on phenotype, were forced to accept Christianity as a religion and way of life and identity. Our Daino ancestors were forced to take on Christian names, customs, and identities or be killed lawfully according to the colonizer's law. Now, this is how, this is how deep this is to understand this. All of the, quote, Hispanic names, many of those <laughs> Hispanic names are also Jewish names, <laughs> uh, Hebrew names unbeknownst to us but these names um coming from the spanish which were coming from moorish iberian peninsula um those groups over there so islamic groups uh hebrew groups uh catholic christian names and all of their political uh ideology and eth eth ethnic uh histories is what we adopted or had were forced to adopt in the names of the encomienderos so when they started to colonize they would send over their nationals and a lot large tracts of land and whoever lived on that land became the subjects of whoever was listed as owning it according to the spanish and involuntary the slavery came right into that because whoever lived on the land was forced to produce First in the form of gold when the, the soldiers were there and they were cutting off and, 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 and raping and punishing our people for not producing enough for them that they wanted because they wanted to keep and send some back to Spain. First through that system, then through agriculture and through making the land bear fruit for them. Because what people are going back into now is viable knowledge which was derived from us and how we live on the land. Our dino ancestors were forced to take these names. First through the categorization system that they brought through the socioeconomic system of slavery, saying now you are property of this encomiendero, this European immigrant who now owns your land and you have to pay uh, some form of rent to. And then through having to live with that name to function within the military control society that was instituted, then further through census reclassification, through racial reclassification, through renaming and deleting the names of how we believed ourselves to be and recreating those things in a mode and way that the European could control. So this is why names and identity are so important. How you see yourself is so important. If you don't identify as being of your ancestors, as carrying their culture forward, then the culture does die. This is why our names and our identity are so much a part of our honor. Because if you're carrying around the colonizer's name and you don't carry your own name according to lineage and creed, then you are giving honor to the European colonization and not to your ancestors. Today, with legislation such as uh, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, the Organization of American States Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, we are afforded our dual identity where you may have to carry around this European name, social security number, and all these things to function within this society here in America, yet you have the right to your dual identity, to your cultural reference, your cultural identity. Joel Rosario on, on the left, and on the right, Ture Watay no Kai. One is public, Joel Rosario, because I'm forced to carry this around to function in this society according to all the contracts that have been made, my social security number, my uh, military record, and the other one is private. And allows me 
to do all the things that I need to do according to my indigenousness and reclaim remedy, redress, and repatriation through our, my rights. This is what we have as victims of genocide, as descendants of indigenous aboriginal people. You may not know that you have these rights, but you do. So I recommend what you do is learn through the UNDRIP, United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, uh, ADRIP, Organization of American States Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. You can Google and find these documents, download them, read them, and get to know them to understand what our duty is today to seek remedy, redress, repatriation of our lands, remedy for the historical wrongs done, redress to the cases, redress through financial compensation, redress through social uh, uh, benefits reclamation, repatriation through reowning our land, to so coming back and addressing the historical wrongs through court cases, probate, all these things to reclaim what is ours. And this is what we're working on doing. And this is what our mission is as as a, a Taino people and as a tribe. Our people are confused as far as citizenship, legal standing, and jurisdiction issues. We believe the first step towards remedy for the Taino people to recover from the Holocaust and victimization is reclamation of our Taino identity and birthrights through reclassification. The Sibuco Bayamon Taino tribe and trust charter is founded on preserving and promoting the history and culture of our Taino people. We teach and promote awareness about the plight of our Taino descendants and the colonial status of Boricin in the law and the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. The Sibuco Bayamon Taino Trust is a tribe, a nation founded from Sibuco Bayamon Taino Tribal Trust Charter and Nation was founded in Providence in Rhode Island for the well-being of Taino people, beginning with the Taino families descended from the Sibuku and Bayamon, Sibuku and Mahawakasikasco areas. The trust exists under Hague Convention Trust Treaty Standards. Section 1 is our mission, and that's to provide and promote opportunities for community and economic and personal and professional development and educational attainment and social and civic activism for members of our tribe. Our vision is to preserve and promote and cultivate Taino and Aboriginal history, culture, and tradition to and for the greater community. So this is why we're teaching about these subjects. This is why we're taking our time. This is why we're producing the videos. This is why we are moving in the way that we move. In order to preserve and promote our lineage, history, ethno history, form of government and belief system for our future to be sustainable in this world and not be absorbed and simply turn into a property of a foreign ideology, a black. You're a Latino. Uh, uh, none of those things have any rights. That's why uh, the amendments in the U.S. Constitution has to do with um, civil rights exist. Because you're a property, an intellectual property of this system. You have no rights. So you have to be granted civil rights, rights within this play game society <laughs> for you to be considered anything. Because in reality, the game is on you, unbeknownst to you. That's the only reason you have to be given civil rights. Because in reality, we're the nobles and lords of this land. We the law and God in Dios. So if you have continued questions, um, you can contact me, Chief Turewataino Kukai Kasikwang, Tribal Trust Manager, at sibukobayamon.chief at gmail.com. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash sibukobayamontaino tribal nation, spelled exactly as it's listed here, no spaces. 
and there we can engage in dialogue you can get educated with these videos more videos will be forthcoming but again this was our my presentation of our names our honor our identity our names our honor our identity honor your ancestors by honoring your titles Understanding what a name is and understanding what identity is and what your identity is. Hahom Bomatum Mawika Quayario Kama Kama Quayari Daneke Bohio Wariko Choreto. Hear me, my people. Welcome to the Roundhouse. Come into abundance, the abundance of your lineage, the abundance of your birthright, the abundance of your inheritance, the abundance of your culture, the abundance of who you truly are, and come out of the poverty of your misclassification, the poverty of your victimization, the poverty of the labels you have accepted and been coerced into accepting. The poverty of your deprivation, do not accept it. Change your mind. Change your conscious resolve and come into the abundance. Ha home. Seneco Kakona, many blessings. Have a great day. Hey, look, if you like the hoodie I'm wearing, you can go order yours at shop A4 Pure or A4 Truth.com. I'm going to put the link down below. This is called Ripples and Reflections, the hoodie. So you got all the flags. So you got the ancestral bird right there. That's the blue macaw. You got all the flags with the nations of the Caribbean. Under a pool of water, and the blue macaw comes in and touches it. Remind of you, reminding you of your indigenous roots, your Dino identity. You know what I'm saying? You want to support us? Shop a few a four. And you can also find the book on a four truth implications and ramifications of the artificial black identity. The Chinese to 1968. You can find information that further talks about all of this. And a lot more. This is heavy work being done. Thanks to the brother Tomahawk Tony. Thank you uh, to all y'all that support A4. Um, and to all y'all that support Chief Turewa, Sinikobaya Montaino Tribe, Federation of Aboriginal Nations of America, and um, the movement. To bring honor to your ancestors. Our home.